Okay, thank you very much, everybody, and welcome uh, to my session on management of epilepsy. Uh, I'm looking around the room, and I have to say, I don't think I recognise anybody here. So just, just uh, put your hands up if you actually deal with patients and have to advise on epilepsy management. So it's a relatively small number of you, so I'm going to assume, therefore, that many of you will have really very little idea of the whole issue of epilepsy and brain tumours, and therefore if, you, if I say something which just doesn't make sense, just, just stop and, uh, and let's, get let's get clarity. Um, so I'm a neurologist at Queen Square, the National Hospital. We're a major neuroscience centre. I've been doing this job since 1999, so I've built up a very large cohort of patients with primary brain tumours, mainly low-grade gliomas, um, and um, have sort of learnt as I've gone along about the management of epilepsy and, and, and how, hopefully, to do it well. <coughs> To give a background, um, epilepsy is an, is an incredibly important symptom in, in brain tumour management and represents approximately 15% of the burden of what we call intractable epilepsy in the UK. And intractable epilepsy or refractory epilepsy has a specific definition. It means that patients are continuing to get seizures despite adequate doses of at least two anti-epileptic drugs. Um, and what's interesting, particularly about brain tumour epilepsy, is you would have thought that the more malignant the brain tumour, the worse the epilepsy. And as it turns out, the sort of the irony or the paradox of brain tumour epilepsy is that quite often the most difficult epilepsy to manage is in patients with lower grade gliomas. Uh, it's actually very rare for me to have difficulties controlling high grade glioma associated associated epilepsy. And you can see that if you, if you look at the proportion of patients who have epilepsy amongst the different tumours, astrocytomas and oligodendrogliomas, these are the low-grade tumours, the proportion is 80 plus, 80% 80 plus. By the time you get down to metastases and glioblastoma, it's between 15 and 40%. And overall, approximately a third of patients with brain tumours taken as a whole have epilepsy. Now, what, if, if you're not aware of what epilepsy is about, epilepsy is essentially, it is a cortical grey matter disorder. So therefore, kids, children with brain tumours, who most commonly have their brain tumours in their posterior fossa, will not have epilepsy, by and large. So epilepsy implies, in the context of a brain tumour, that that brain tumour is in the cerebral cortex, affecting grey matter. And even within the, the, the cauliflower that we recognise as the cerebral cortex, there is large variation in the epileptogenicity of different parts of the brain. In other words, this particular area, which is called the central sensory motor area, and the blue is primary motor cortex and the red is primary sensory cortex, that is the most epileptogenic area, and that is... Um, about 80 to 90% of patients with a tumour in that region will have epilepsy, and often difficult epilepsy. The next most epileptogenic area is one which you can't quite see because it's sort of tucked inside the medial temporal lobe. And then the parietal lobe, and least epileptogenic of all is the occipital lobe. And interestingly, occipital lobe tumours are probably the least common of all our brain tumours. So there's something about epileptogenicity and tumorogenicity, the same parts of the brain. And as I've said, most tumours, pretty much all tumours that cause epilepsy, will have cortical involvement and some will have subcortical involvement. Now, epilepsy is a massive subject. There are conferences, worldwide international conferences, on epilepsy. And so, in what way is epilepsy in a brain tumour patient different from epilepsy in the general population? Well, the first and the most obvious is that because you have an abnormal brain, in other words, underlying structural disease, in this case a tumour, it's much more likely to be refractory epilepsy. 
Second of all, because brain tumour patients at some point in their treatment will almost certainly require some form of chemotherapy, you've got to think about potential drug, important drug interactions between your anti-epileptic drugs, that's what AED stands for, anti-epileptic drugs, and chemotherapy. And third of all, essentially your patient with a low-grade glioma has two diseases. He has, or she has, the low-grade glioma and all the concerns about the potential transformation to high-grade disease and epilepsy. And therefore, when a patient with a low-grade glioma, for example, has been seizure-free for many years, starts getting seizures, that represents not just uh, an, an inconvenience and a nuisance, but also an enormous source of anxiety over the possibility that this tumour is now in the process of transformation. This used to be a problem when phenytoin was given out willy-nilly, because phenytoin toxicity can mimic the symptoms of a brain tumour. And finally, and perhaps most importantly to our patients, the driving regulations for patients with brain tumours and epilepsy are more stringent um, than the uh, driving regulations for patients with epilepsy. So that, for example, even in someone who's had a solitary seizure, found to have a low-grade glioma with a tiny bit of high-grade features, that automatically will put them banned for two years. And it's one year for a low-grade glioma, and I still have problems with the DVLA trying to persuade them to give the license back because some radiologist has reported some minor progression. So these are issues that patients with low-grade gliomas and high-grade gliomas face particularly. And this is perhaps the most difficult thing for them to get their head round. So in terms of how you, as allied health professionals, CNSs, therapists, uh, are involved in the management of brain tumour epilepsy, what the brain tumour epilepsy patient needs, and I know this sounds absolutely glaringly obvious, is they need regular neurology review. And I'm sure some of you work in centres where they don't get to see neurologists. Is that right? Yes. I was, at a, I was just at the As Association of British Neurology Conference and there was a poster presented by a neurologist from, I'm not saying which centre, but an absolutely massive neuroscience centre somewhere in the Midlands and only 39% of their patients actually got to see a neurologist with brain tumour epilepsy. And I, I find that staggering. I find that absolutely staggering. Because oncologists, I, I would never dare dream to advise on different chemotherapy agents. Why on earth would an oncologist expect to be able to know the variety and the inter interactions and side effects of anti-epileptic drugs? And sometimes the neurosurgeons themselves take it on. And it's actually, it was, this poster was gratifying that actually not all neurosurgeons are immediately putting their patients on phenytoin, which was, which was actually in advance. But up to fairly recently, a neurosurgeon knew one drug for epilepsy, and that was phenytoin. So they need regular neurology review. The problem about neurologists is that we sit in our clinics and we see so many patients, and it's actually quite difficult when a patient has some seizures to get in touch with us and to have that immediate answers. And that's where really I think the therapist and my CNS, who's not here I don't think, Hannah, is fantastic at being able to manage and reassure. And then if it's an issue that requires some neurology expertise, she'll refer it back to me and the patient. So that I think is absolutely essential that they, the patients need to have ready access when seizures deteriorate. They also need access to the newer drugs. I've mentioned phenytoin already. If anybody with a brain tumour with brain tumour epilepsy is on older drugs, that, in my view, is, is, is wrong. It's actually, I wouldn't say it's negligent, but it's certainly not best practice. And, you know, as I'll show you later, there are so many new drugs, it's impossible to keep up with them unless you're doing neurology. And then, of course, they need that support because they're unable to drive and what they are able to access, for example, freedom passes, various benefits, etc. That's where your expertise comes in. Now, when I first started in 1999, I started collecting patients. And within three years, I had 100 or so patients. And I actually looked to see what 
how well I was doing. In other words, how many of these patients were truly intractable or refractory. And I was a bit uh, shocked to see that actually 50% of my patients had intractable epilepsy. And uh, I thought, God, I'm doing a terrible job until I actually looked in the literature and there was another similar series from Rome uh, by another very experienced neuro-oncologist and his figure for intractability was identical. And then as I'll show you later, a surgical series from the States came out uh, looking at surgery in low-grade gliomas, and their figure was exactly the same, 50% intractable epilepsy. So I think this is the right figure. It, in other words, your chances of having ongoing epilepsy once you have a brain tumour is 50%. It's 50 cents, a high, high rate compared to the general epilepsy population where that is about 20 to 30, 30% at most. However, it's not all bad because epilepsy has long been regarded as a good prognostic factor. This was a small study from the Netherlands looking at 90 patients with low-grade gliomas and it's quite an old study and the patients who had epilepsy as their only problem survived longer, considerably longer, than patients who had other symptoms such as focal deficits or, or raised intracranial pressure. However, it's an old study and I think we need to interpret that to say that my hunch is that most patients who have so-called low-grade gliomas but present with, for example, progressive neurological deficits, they are really high-grade gliomas. And uh, I, don't, I think you probably had a lecture earlier on which is really re challenging all our previous concepts of what really a low-grade glioma is and what a high-grade glioma is. And there's certainly quite a few low-grade gliomas, and I see them. They look like low-grade gliomas, but the patients are behaving like high-grade, and that's because they don't have the IDH mutation. So I think a number of these patients were probably not low-grade gliomas. We looked at this at UCLH, and we collected, um, I think, about uh, 80 or 90 patients and we split them into two groups. These were all patients who had come through the radiotherapy department at UCLH. In other words, they had transformation. And what we did was we looked back and called, and, and group one were patients who never had a seizure other than maybe their first seizure at presentation or very rare once a year type seizures. And group two had active epilepsy. And we looked to see what their survival was and staggeringly, these patients, the group one patients, their median survival was about 14 years. The median survival of group two was about seven years. In other words, even, and we corrected for a number of factors, epilepsy per se in the context of a low-grade glioma is, I think, a poor prognostic factor. So it goes against the actual uh, sort of myth or the, or the, or the literature. So, let's talk about treatment of epilepsy. It's actually quite difficult to find good evidence based uh, in the literature for the treatment of epilepsy in brain tumours. The reason is that most of the epilepsy literature with regard to brain tumours looks mainly at what I'd call the really very benign group of mainly paediatric tumours which are not completely different biologically from adult low grades. And most of the oncology literature, which talks about the actual brain tumour itself and the survival, is concentrating on progression-free survival, overall survival, rather than actual a measure of epilepsy control. So um, we have to dig hard. And this paper, which came out of a neurosurgical centre, published now eight years ago, is a, an excellent a series, a very large series, over 330 patients, all of whom had surgery for low-grade glioma. And it was addressing the issue of surgery in low-grade glioma. And 80% of their low-grade glioma population had seizures, so that's about right. And here we are, here's that figure, that 50% had intractable seizures. So this was not a particularly this was not a selected group for very bad epilepsy or very good epilepsy. This was, I think, a very representative group of the adult low-grade glioma population. And reassuringly, if you add up 
the percentage of patients who were seizure-free a year after surgery or who had a very significant improvement that came up to 92%. So when we refer patients for brain tumour surgery on low-grade glimers, we can offer them some very encouraging uh, optimism that the epilepsy is highly likely to improve significantly. And it doesn't come as any great surprise that when, you, when they looked at the factors that were more likely to predict a good response to, epilep uh, to surgery in terms of epilepsy, those who were operated on sooner before the epilepsy, in a sense, had had a time to really bed down, and those who'd had a big resection, a gross total resection, was associated with a more favourable prognosis. So the first message is surgery, brain tumour surgery for low-grade glioma is good for epilepsy. The second message is, and this is a much, much smaller series, only 43 patients, and these patients all had medically intractable seizures. So this was not a, a general group. This was a highly selected group. The next message is that both at three months and at 12 months after radiotherapy, the patients who were in what we call Engel class 1, 2, and 3, so that is these three lower uh, shaded areas, um, irrespective of whether they were grade two or grade three, had a meaningful improvement in their seizure control. So at three months, about 70%, and at, um, and at 12 months, also about 70%. So message two is radiotherapy is also good for epilepsy. And I have sent a number of patients over the years to my radiotherapy colleagues, not because their tumours are growing, but simply because I cannot control their epilepsy, and the epilepsy is ruining their life. So now we move on to what I would call day-to-day -day practical considerations. How do we manage brain tumour epilepsy? The principles are pretty identical to the management of any epilepsy. The first one is make sure you've got the diagnosis right. It's usually a bit easier. If somebody's got a brain tumour and they have a funny dizzy spell and they have a number of these dizzy spells, it's most likely to be epilepsy. However, having a brain tumour makes you very anxious and when people get anxious they get panic attacks. And panic attacks can be very like epilepsy. And I've had a number of patients sent to me with brain tumours, with temporal lobe epilepsy, who are having more seizures despite increasing doses of anti-epileptic drugs. And it turns out they're not having more seizures, they're having non-epileptic seizures or what's called non-epileptic attack disorder, sometimes mixed in with panic attacks. The second point I want to really make very clear is that because we know that 50% of our patients are going to be intractable, what I don't want to do is to strive so rigorously to get control of every last seizure that I end up with a zombie, okay? Because the more drugs you give and the higher the doses, even with the newer anti-epileptic drugs, you're much more likely to sedate them. It, these drugs all affect cognitive functioning, even subtly. And the, the higher functioning they are, the more often sometimes the more sensitive they are to these drugs. Having said that, I have patients, I have I'm, my, my most fabulous example is actually a radiologist who was taking her final FRCR exams on huge doses of levetiracetam and lamotrigine and so she was managing very well on big doses of anti-epileptic drugs. But we have to be prepared to accept less than perfect seizure control uh, rather than, as I say, the expense of severe side effects, limiting side effects. Now, the principle of epilepsy management in terms of drug treatment is diametrically opposite to the principle of cancer treatment. In can oh, sorry, yes. So, yeah, intractable is uh, epilepsy that is, so persistent seizures despite two or more anti-epileptic drugs at therapeutic doses. That is the definition of intractable epilepsy. So... The principles of cancer of, of uh, anti-epileptic drug therapy are diametrically opposite to the principles of cancer therapy. So if you go and have treatment for a lymphoma, you will get automatically generally four drugs, four cancer drugs, at as high a dose as possible, which is designed to kill the cancer, but not you. 
Okay? Whereas we try and go for, for as few drugs as possible and as at low dose as possible. So we start low and we go slow. And we aim ideally for monotherapy. And in neuro-oncology, we almost exclusively use non-enzyme-inducing anti-epileptic drugs. Non-enzyme-inducing anti-epileptic drugs. Do you know what that means? Or should I explain that? So basically... The older anti-epileptic drugs, phenytoin, carbamazepine, phenobarbitone, they were all enzyme-inducing. They turned the liver enzymes on. So they increased the metabolism of drugs. The newer drugs are non-enzyme-inducing. Now, why is that important? So it's important for a number of reasons. The most important reasons are in terms of drug interactions. So other drugs, particularly in women, the combined oral contraceptive pill is metabolized by the liver, and therefore any woman on the pill, if you put her on phenytoin or carbamazepine, and you fail to warn her that the pill can no longer be relied on for contraception, you can end up in court. And that has happened. People, somebody has sued a neurologist for falling pregnant. So that's the chemotherapy is another issue as well. So all drugs, well not all, but most drugs are metabolized through the liver. And these drugs, these older anti-epileptic drugs, induce, they turn on the metabolism. So we avoid them and we use now. We have so many non-enzyme inducing agents, there really is no excuse. So you put somebody on a first line drug... It works, fantastic. If it doesn't work, what do you do then? So there's a bit of a division of uh, opinion. Some people say you automatically go to a second line drug and add on. My preference is to try another first line first. So get them off the first line, get them off the first first line and try a second first line. And if the second first line also doesn't work, then I add on. So I go one, one and then two. Some people go one, two. And there are actually quite good theoretical reasons for both approaches. It's just my personal preference. The other thing is you change one thing at a time because otherwise you don't know where you are. So particularly, it's particularly tempting when someone comes to you and they're on stable medication and they suddenly have a flurry of seizures or their seizures are getting worse, for you to say, right, we'll put this one up, we'll put that one up, uh, we'll drop this one, and you don't know where you are. So you change one thing at a time. Now, this is something which I never believed, I never even thought of until one of my patients told me that he was very reluctant to take the medication I was prescribing for his epilepsy because if he took the drugs and they suppressed his seizures, he would have no idea whether his tumour was getting worse or not. So I have to reassure him that we actually keep an eye on his tumour by virtue of the MRI scan and that we'd rather, much rather he didn't have seizures. The other thing is, discuss side effects, give context. What does that mean? That means you tell the patient, throw away the data sheet. You open the packet. Any, any of you on medication? I'm on, medic- I'm on hyper t- blood pressure medication. You open the packet. Every single packet I get, I get a massive data sheet. If I read that data sheet, I'd never take a drug. You'd never take a paracetamol, would you? And the, the data sheet there is not for the benefit of the patient. The data sheet is for the benefit of the drug company to protect them against getting sued for your urine tearing purple or something like that. So give the context. Say, I've treated so many patients with this drug. This is the ma- these are the main side effects that you may experience. And this is what to do if you get the side effects. And there's only one side effect, really, where you have to say, if you get this side effect, you must stop the drug straight away. And do you know what that is? Rash, rash. Rash, and the one that the real, uh, the most, the bigger offender is now lamotrigine, lamotrigine rash. And when you get a lamotrigine rash, it's not a little bit of an itchy pimple. It is a whole body, uh, red, I've got, I've got a picture actually on my phone of somebody who had lamotrigine rash. Um, and it's, if you don't, um, you know, you don't treat it, it will go and get worse and worse. And I was phoned up yesterday by actually a patient, uh, um, a, a, a paediatric oncologist. They've got a young man who was put on phenytoin and is now in ITU with 
Stevens-Johnson syndrome, so widespread breakdown of his skin. So phenytoin was a particularly bad offender for that. The newer drugs, other than lamotrigine, are generally not associated with rash, generally not. And the other thing is, encourage a seizure diary. Who remembers what they had for breakfast three days ago? How on earth can we expect patients with brain tumours, all of whom complain of poor memory, to be able to remember when they come for their three or six monthly review how many seizures they've really had? So please keep a seizure diary so that I know and you know whether we're making any impact. Okay. So I'm going to spend 10, I've been told 10 minutes, so I'm going to move on very quickly because what I don't want to do is to go through every single drug. In the, You can see this is a timeline going from 1840 when the only anti-epileptic drug for basically the best part of 60 and 70 years was bromide. And the National Hospital was set up in 1861. I know that because 2011 was the 150th anniversary. They were the biggest orderer of bromide pretty much in the world, and that was because it was the only thing that worked for epilepsy. And then in the early 1900s came phen phenobarbitone, and then just before the war, phenytoin. And then when I qualified, which was there, we had these drugs. So we had sodium valparate, carbamazepine, primidone, and benzodiazepines. That was it. And since I've qualified, and I don't take any credit for this, all these drugs. Now, tell me, how on earth is anybody ever going to remember any of these things? You know? So you've got to have familiarity with a few drugs. And this is basically probably the only slide you need to write down. The first-line drugs nowadays are levetiracetam, otherwise known as Keppra, or Lamotrigine, otherwise known as Lamictal. And the second-line drug... I'm using now more and more lacosamide, otherwise known as Vimpat. And I like that. I like the fact that some of my patients are on the three L's, levetiracetam, lamotrigine, lacosamide. If I have to give them sodium valparate, it completely spoils the symmetry of their <laughs> prescription. Sodium valparate is a relatively older drug and is an interesting drug. It's used, it, was, it is the best drug for primary generalised epilepsy. So this is not brain tumour epilepsy, this is epilepsy that occurs usually in young people, either absent seizures, myoclonic seizures, generalised tonic clonic. Brilliant, brilliant drug. The big problem with Valparate, does anybody know what the big problem with Valparate is? Uh, for young women, uh, it's... Uh, it's uh, exactly. It's, well, it's more than that. So it is the most teratogenic drug. It's associated with something called fetal valproate syndrome. It can cause neural tube defects. But, as subsequently emerged, even if your baby was totally normal, no defects at all, their neurocognitive development was significantly lower than babies born to mothers with epilepsy taking other anti-epileptic drugs. And... Um, I, I received something quite recently, um, a whole lot of literature. If you've got a patient who's a woman with epilepsy and you're going to prescribe sodium valproate, you've got to give her all this information and you've got to literally instill the fear of God into her. And so, that, so that, that, that is a bit of a problem nowadays because, of course, the risk is never as big as they say it is. But nevertheless, it is a, it is a significant consideration for women of childbearing years. The other really interesting thing about sodium valproate is that when they looked at the glioblastoma clinical trial, they did an ad hoc retrospective analysis of the survival of the patients who were on valproate against non-valproate. And there was a suggestion that actually it improved survival. So there's quite a lot of literature came out, there's quite a lot of European practice that the first line drug you had to give a patient with blood glioblastoma was sodium valproate. Actually, it's now been, the, that evidence has now been turned on its head. It's not true. There is no survival advantage. But nevertheless, you will often hear, see patients with glioblastoma being on sodium valproate or wanting sodium valproate because of that, those data. The only other thing I just want to point out, a couple of two, two things, is 
In patients who are having clusters of seizures, the quickest way of getting control of that is clobazam, which is a benzodiazepine. And, and finally, to remind you that, of course, some patients, although it's quite rare, go into status epilepticus, where you have prolonged seizures without recovery of consciousness. They need hospital treatment. They need intravenous management. There is still a role for intravenous phenytoin, but now we have intravenous formulations of Keppra and Valparate, and really that's you know, the ideal things to treat them with. So I think I can now talk a little bit about these different drugs, um, just to say that levetiracetam is probably our first line agent now. It seems to sort of be the sexy drug of use. It is a very good drug. It doesn't work for everybody. And in just a few patients, it, has, it creates havoc with their, with their mood. They become like bears with sore heads. Most patients' brain tumors are a bit depressed anyway, but sometimes this can make... So if you have a history of depression, I would probably avoid levetiracetam. Um, and because it's useful as, uh, useful as IV, it has been tried and recently published that it's actually better than phenytoin for perioperative seizure control. And these are the prescriptions. Yes, yeah, sorry. Yeah. That's my next question. There's my there's my slide. So lamotrigine is a. <laughs> yeah. No. 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 I'm not in terms of what disinhibition or. Personality change, Kepra rage. No, no. Yeah, I, I've, I've, I've not had any calls from police, casualty. Your patient's gone mad. I haven't had that. Lamotrigine is the older of the two drugs, and has been shown in a major academic study to be the first-line treatment for adult partial-onset epilepsy, which, of course, brain tumour epilepsy is. And then I've put sodium valparate as well because of its interest in glioblastoma and clobazam as well. And I think probably I'm going to just stop there. I've got some more slides, but I think that's really the main messages that I wanted to get across. Yeah, this, this, is, this is a little bit more about the clinical aspects. Um, and I don't want, I, I think rational prescribing is, 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 is basically about trying to combine two different drugs with different mechanisms of action. And that's really not something I think you need to know about. That's much more as neurologists that I need to know about the mechanisms of pharmacological action. So I'm going to stop there because time is short and I wanted to open up for questions, which I'm sure you probably have. And if you don't, then we can move on. Yes? Oh, that's a good question. Yeah, that's a good question. So, so I have, so occasionally I get little flurries of emails from patients saying, I'm, I was on Kepra, but now I've been given levetiracetam. So I talk about generics versus, versus, and there was a little flurry, I have to say, all around the same time where the seizure control got a little bit worse. Most of the time it's not an issue because in this country, fortunately, there's very, very strict quality control for generics. But um, there are the occasional patient who notice a very clear difference when they go on to generics. But it's a minority of patients. You had a question. It was just to ask really what was your experience on how well patients tolerate the Very well. Very well. I'm actually involved in a study called the VIBES study, which was an observational study, VIMPAT, in brain tumour epilepsy. Um, and uh, the, 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 so from my own experience and the literature suggests it is generally pretty well tolerated. I haven't yet had to stop a patient, the cosmide, because of side effects. I've sometimes had to stop it because it wasn't working. The, the, I, the other, I suppose the other big thing, it's not so common, but it does happen now 
more and more patients getting pregnant with brain tumours and what, to, what support to offer them. Um, and I'm fresh up on this, my not because I went to this conference, the ABN conference, and there was a whole discussion about epilepsy drugs in pregnancy. And the good news is that lamotrigine and levetiracetam are very, very safe in pregnancy. And breastfeeding, by the way, that's another thing, breastfeeding. Everybody gets wound up about breastfeeding. The baby's been exposed to this drug for nine months in utero. What's another few months, you know, in much lower concentrations? So that's fine. Um, the valparate thing came out again, how important it was. And just to, just to make sure you all aware that there is something called the Epilepsy in Pregnancy Register, which is run out of Northern Ireland by a neurologist called Jim Morrow. Every patient who has a brain tumour who falls pregnant and is on anti-epileptic medication, please, please encourage them. They just literally click on epilepsy and brain tumour in, sorry, epilepsy and pregnancy on the internet. They get put into the register and it just builds up that huge volume of information that we need to be able to give the best advice to our patients. And it will allow us to pick up if there is a problem with these newer drugs earlier on. Any other questions? Yes. At what point would you say a patient needs to be referred? Because if you were referred to every single patient that potentially had a presentation seizure, surely your clinics would be... No. <laughs> Absolutely. So now I'm just saying, or is uh, that when you get to a point where you're... Right, do you know what? If you start saying that, if you start saying, well, I'm only going to see them if they have more than three or four seizures, I mean, you're going to start cherry picking and what you're not going to do is give the... I think every patient who's had a seizure should see a neurologist. The, the nice guidelines for epilepsy is that every patient who has had... A, an adult patient who has an epileptic seizure should be referred for a scan within two weeks and should see, should see a specialist with an expertise in, in, in epilepsy, that is a neurologist, within four weeks. Why on earth should a brain tumour patient not have that benefit when they're more likely, to, much more likely to have difficult epilepsy? So I would say every patient with brain, even if it's just to say, you're on the right drug, you're under good control, I don't need to see you again, but this is, these are my details if you, have, if you run into problems in the future. I don't, I don't understand that. I don't understand why the neurologist is... Yeah, I don't understand. It's not even him, you mean? <laughs> I, I, can't, I, can't, I can't explain that away. I have no explanation for that one, I'm afraid. Any other questions? So I've kept to time. Kept to time. <laughs> Any other questions? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So what advice do you not have the risks of the falling, the seizure? So again, okay, so so Yes, so exactly. So, so that depends on the nature of the seizure. A lot of the patients, they end up having focal seizures. So may, may, they may have some jerking or they may have sort of sensory disturbance creeping up where there's no effective disturbance in function or they may have some tingling or twitching around the mouth or, for example, you know, where they can just get on with it. So that it's very much depends on... I mean, obviously, anybody having what I call complex partial seizures where there's alterations of awareness and consciousness, that you really have to get on top of, yeah. So it's, it's, it's tailoring, tailoring your treatment. I just want to show you, just to show you um, my... I, I wanted a couple of, to show you a couple of things, because I was asked to talk about innovations. And have any of you heard of vagal nerve stimulation? So uh, Miss Mizorochi, who gave me this slide, she's an epilepsy surgeon. She, we are now starting to look at vagal nerve stimulation in 
patients with intractable epilepsy. And I've sent, we've already just done one patient. She had a brain tumor. She's been left with a lot of gliosis, terrible epilepsy, nothing worked. I tried every drug under the sun, various combinations, and we've now put a vagal nerve stimulator in. And that basically just fits under the, under the clavicle and the wire, this is the electrode, the wire winds around the vagus nerve and it basically just delivers a small pulse. There you are. So it's intermittent electrical pulses to the left vagal nerve and uh, it's been tried in obviously most severe epilepsy and it seems to cause an improvement in about 25% of patients. And it's a pretty minor procedure compared to obviously doing some major brain tumour surgery. So in terms of innovations, this is really cutting edge for brain tumour epilepsy and maybe in a couple of years' time I'll present a series of patients that we've tried that on. So I just wanted to... No, 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 sorry, no, this is for epilepsy, yeah. Now, this has been around now for probably about 10 years for epilepsy, but as I say, for no one has ever taken on brain tumour patients because traditionally brain tumour patients were never put into epilepsy trials because of the progressive nature. So I just wanted to share that with you. And I'll just show you also my, 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 uh, my biggest patient, oops, hang on, was this guy who's got multifocal sort of glioma. You can see how it's sort of lining the room of his... And he is now on... So he is now on levetiracetam, sodium valparate, clobazam, lecosamide, phenobarbitone, parampanol, and lamotrigine. So he is my... And, and not only is he vertical, he is actually... <laughs> He is actually working full-time in a high-powered surveying job. And he came into hospital a number of times, but the second time in May last year, he had intractable, what we call EPC, epilepsia partialis continua. So literally every two minutes he did this for about a minute or two. And it was just ongoing and intractable and he was taken down to ITU because they were afraid they'd have to intubate and ventilate him and eventually we got control of it and I'm pleased to say that it's now a year now and he's pretty much been almost entirely seizure free on this massive combination of drugs. Sorry? And just to, exactly, <laughs> and if having a brain tumour was enough, his white cell count was going up and up and up and he's been diagnosed with CML, can you believe it? A chronic myeloid leukaemia. Um, so he came uh, it, um, about three or four weeks, three or four weeks. But we were ramping up drugs pretty quickly because this was in hospital. And, I, and, I, and of course, when he comes up for review and he's seizure free and he's been through what he's been through, he doesn't want to start fiddling with his drugs, particularly when he's feeling okay. So I just thought I'd share that with you. Okay, thank you. <laughs>